Hello and good evening, friends. Welcome to this special edition of the SNS webinars. As you all are aware that this is the birth month of our president, Professor Yoko Kato. We are celebrating this month in a very special way. As I mentioned in my previous webinars, our agreement with the theme publishers continues. And the attendees of these webinars will also get the link of the registration for the Medwan Neurosurgery site. This will give you free access to a large cache of neurosurgery literature, which includes ebooks, e journals, case discussions, and videos absolutely free. Coming back to our webinars, today we have two very interesting topics from two giants of neurosurgery. The first speaker for today is a well renowned personality in the world of neurosurgery, Professor Ranil Nanda. Professor Nanda is the Peter W. Carmel MD Chair of Neurological Surgery, Ridges University, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, Ridges, New Jersey Medical School, New Jersey, USA. Professor Nanda was the past chairman, secretary, and president of the North American Skull Bay Society. He was the past president of the Society of University Neurosurgeons and Southern Neurosurgical Society. He is an integral part of the ANS, CNS, and the WFNS. He has won several awards and honors during his vast illustrious career for the contributions to neurosurgery. He has published nearly 500 manuscripts in various international journals, 60 book chapters, and four textbooks, which include some most noted complications in neurosurgery and principles of post process surgery. He has been an invited guest speaker on more than 100 occasions to several countries. He also features on the editorial board of several leading neurosurgery journals. He has been a mentor to several neurosurgery residents from the low and middle income countries. Today, he has aptly chosen his title of his lecture as Micro Neurosurgery Metacognition and Mentorship. We are so privileged to have him as a speaker today for our webinars. The second speaker for today is Professor Hugh G. Professor G is the Chief of Functional Neurosurgery Group, Professor of Neurosurgery, Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. He is a member of the Chinese Association Against Epilepsy and also the past Vice President of the Shanghai Association Against Epilepsy. He has authored several publications in the field of epilepsy. We are so grateful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at the ACNS webinars. As November is the Epilepsy Awareness Month, he is going to talk about resurrective surgery and refractory epilepsy due to lesions of the motor cortex. To chair this session of Professor Anil Nanda and Professor Huji today, we have with us Professor Ahmed Damar, who is a professor and consultant neurosurgeon at the KFHU Dhaman, Saudi Arabia. He is an integral part of the WFNS and is a member of several of its committees. He is the co-chairman of the WFNS Ethics Committee. He is the author of many noted books, among which includes one of the most downloaded ones from Springer, which is titled Hydrocephalus, What We Know and What We Still Don't Know. He has published over 150 manuscripts in various international journals and has also given over 500 lectures in various international avenues. We are indeed grateful to him to have him today as a chair for this session. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SENS and President Professor Yuko Kato, I hereby welcome today's speaker, Professor Anil Landa and Professor Huji, as well as the chair, Professor Ahmed Ammar, to this online platform of SENS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Seng from Malaysia is my first for today. A um, lot of demand, so I appreciate everybody doing that. Professor Chingji from uh, China, and Ahmed is a really dear friend. He's an expert, a world expert on ethics. So. Uh, thank you for sharing this with us. And Araja, thank you for organizing everything. So I think it's interesting to go to the history of the ACNS. I mean, there's a lot of um, a lot of hunted people that went to make this what it is. Uh, and I think we would be remiss if not, in not acknowledging them. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Kano, Professor Kato, and I call Yoko the, the uh, Mother Teresa of global neurosurgery because she has done so much for the world and we are very, very deeply appreciative. And I want to congratulate Imad and Ling Feng and Aip Cherian and Aka. So great group of people. Uh, and I thank you again for having me for this session. So I want to thank Professor Huji and um, uh, Emma Damar for sort of being part of this. So I, you know, we wouldn't be having this meeting were not for COVID. So in, in the United States, COVID is still a problem. Yesterday we had over 116,000 cases. Uh, so it's, uh, but it's made the world closer. We've become virtual. We're all family. We are in each other's living rooms. So I thought I would talk about micro neurosurgery, metacognition, and mentorship because I feel for the younger part, uh, you know, younger audience, it's important to talk about mentorship. You know, as I get to the evening of my career, I appreciate all of the people who helped me during the morning. You know, and I think all of us have a great debt of gratitude 
to mentors. And I think metacognition is important because in neurosurgery, thinking about thinking is important. That's how you become good. That's how you look at complications. That's how you look at education. That's how you look at publications. So in all those instances, metacognition comes, you know, comes through. So I think when you look at the history of what we do of microneurosurgery, these are sort of the first trephinations in the Peruvian skulls. So we have a rich history. And then in Greek mythology, we know Hephaestus, uh, Zeus has a bad headache and Hephaestus cuts open his head to give birth to Athena. So a lot of interesting history with craniotomies. And the Egyptians taught us that, you know, you know the, the brain is not important. They thought the spine was everything. So it was a different point of view. The Jed symbol was a symbol of the spine. So always with the spine neurosurgeons, I tell them, you have a rich Egyptian his, uh, heritage, whereas we, our heritage is over. And then in, the, in my own Indian culture, uh, the symbol of Ganesh is when an elephant's head is cut off. And it's the first instance of brain transplant mythologically. And we sort of published that paper on mythological and prehistorical origins of neurosurgery. And if you look at the skull, you can see this is one of the first instances of a skull, uh, you know, being used as a portrait. Uh, and you can see there's burr holes there and it, the, saw, the skull has been cut open. So surgery has a great history there. And then in contemporary art, the skull becomes a symbol with so many painters. You can see whether it's Cezanne or Richter, people have wonderful depictions of the skull, which is the start of our, uh, of our skill set. So if you look at microneurosurgery, which I think, you know, you may be a DBS person or a spine doctor or, you know, which are, we all come from the microscope. And you look, the earliest microscope was founded by Campini in about 1635 in the 16th century. Then Nyland introduced um, in the ears. We really owe a big debt of, uh, you know, big debt of gratitude to our ENT colleagues because House was the one who used it. This is sort of the Littman scope. And then Ted Kersey and Jacobson and Donahue. I actually took a course when I was a resident in Vermont, which is where Ghazi Yasagil really learned microneurosurgery and did an ECIC bypass on a dog. So I always tell the residents, you know, when I was a fellow with Peter Janetta, I did like a hundred rat carotids. And I think it's so important to spend time in the lab getting good at this. And I'll talk a little bit about metacognition in terms of anatomy and doing dissections. It's so important to learn the rudiments and then to make sure your hands go well. So I've been very blessed in a career that I've done over 18,000 surgeries, you know, over 6,000 craniotomies. But that's what I thought with microneurosurgery, I would just go through some illustrative cases. I thought maybe we'll start with the spine. This was a young person that had difficulty swallowing and had problems with, uh, with facial food and stuff, and you can see why. So this is a, a thoracic hemangioblastoma that is called the syrinx that's gone all the way up to the almost, right almost at the pons, and had severe lower cranial deficits. And uh, here it is, we're operating on this um, with intraoperative monitoring and going into the cord itself. Uh, and I think this is where, at least for the younger people, I think having good technique and being really good technically is something we should always aspire for and not compromise. So you can see here, there's a, a nice lesion right there in the center and we are making a nice plane around it. And this was a hemangioblastoma uh, you don't want to take this out piecemeal. And here you can see that's your nice plane once you get into the syrinx. So the microsurgery is a really important part of our armamentarium. And I always feel that it's sort of metacognition. You have to work at this and you have to be good at it. And uh, that's how we all get better. So here it is. This is the whole tumor taken out. And he actually did very well, went back to school with no syrinx or anything like that. So here's the case that I did after I moved to uh, New Jersey. This is a young girl that had trouble with, um, she was socially completely bereft. She got divorced and you can see why she got divorced. So, so this is almost like a grapefruit, 12 centimeter lesion. I always come from one side and this is the case that we did here. 
Uh, again, microsurgery, very good technique. So this is a very large tumor. Uh, so here, this tumor, we couldn't even uh, use the CUSA. That's how firm it was. So here you can see we're peeling it off. But what we did is we used, uh, we had to use the bovi just to debulk it. You can see that because you nothing would cut through the tumor. So sometimes it's not pretty, you know what I mean? Uh, here it is, we're moving it under the frontal lobe there. And again, I want to stress microsurgery is an art form. You know, whether you're doing dancing or doing basketball, art is art and you have to work at your art. There's no shortcuts to working on your art. So here you can see we are nice in a nice plane, peeling it off. Uh, and you can see we've come to the inferior part there, big vessels there. And then I'll go down to the base again. But see, the CUSA really didn't work on this. So I had to use the bovi to debulk it. You see that? So cut and, you know, cut and sort of remove. Here it is. We're taking a big piece off here now. But you know, if you go same thing with microsurgery, if you're if you're very if you're not cautious enough, you you really were. So here's the internal carotid. You can see the temporal lobe, internal carotid, and now we'll peel this off the uh, anterior cerebral there. So MCA internal car carotid, and here the perforators are important. Sometimes you get a little bleeder from the perforators. So she really did well. This is on post-op day three. She's walking and we got everything from one side. So uh, a really good outcome. And sometimes with these you know, large tumors, again here, this is somebody who was institutionalized for dementia and we removed that. And I think the real sort of micro neurosurgery art is when you're really somewhere in the brain stem. So these are cavernous malformations. Um, this is just to show you cav mal in the brain stem. Uh, I normally will do this depending on the axis. You have to go through uh, Kavasa's triangle. This one, I went retromastoid. Here you can see uh, the safe entry zone for the brain stem. I'm using the famous stereotactic system, making a small opening there. And it's always tense till you get in there. And now you can see we're in the brain stem. And here I'm always cautious, you know, there's normally a draining vein, you know, if you leave a small piece behind with these cav mouths, they can be a recurrence. I still have about 50 of these in the brainstem. And I can tell you that I've had two or three recurrences and it's always if you leave a little piece behind. So the one thing I like to caution you is, you know, you want to be really, really careful. Now, part of it is you're in the brainstem, you don't want to hurt anything. And here you can see the clots coming out, but we're making sure we have a nice plane around the uh, cab map. And technically these aren't that hard. I think it's just the approach that's very, you know, that has to be very cautious, yeah. And here you can see now we have the whole cab map surrounded. Uh, and she did very well. Here's another cav mal that we just did recently. Uh, sorry about that, that didn't work. And in this case, we had some trouble. So you can see here, we're going above. The last case, we went below the seventh, eighth cranial nerve complex. Here, we're going superior to that. And this is the critical part when you go into the brain stem that you really don't want to hurt anything at all. In this case, the clot was smaller, but here it is, we're in it, and we were able to get, uh, remove that as well. Here you can see entering the clot. And then sometimes a cav mal can be posteriorly on the floor of the fourth ventricle. So this young man, it had bled a couple of times, three times, and I don't use gamma knife unless I don't think I can remove it. Um, 
unfortunately the video tape didn't come on with this. But anyway, we went through the floor of this and we were able to get that. So I think there's an Italian world called sprezzatura and it means the art of effortless mastery. And my plea to all the students and residents is that you must try to be completely effortless and you have to work at this. Microsurgery is a real discipline that you work hard at. And you must be open about mistakes. So this is from James Joyce's book. He says, a man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are portals to his genius. So, I mean, I think we have, this is very arrogant, but you know, people look at all this. So this is the cavernous malformation. I thought I'd not put it in, but here it is. That's the last MRI that I showed you. So here we, I saved up all the initial parts. So you're looking at the floor of the fourth ventricle. Right there, you can see the redness there. And this is, but you know, going through the fourth ventricle, let me tell you, you touch the floor of the fourth ventricle and you're gonna have some deficit, okay? So even though I was right on the lesion, I took the clot, I took the entire thing off. He had a little bit of visual issues. Um, and so you have to be very, very cautious, yeah. So we remove this and he actually did very well, but he had a little facial weakness, which has improved. And here you can see the post-op, we've got a complete resection of that. So I think microneurosurgery is a real discipline. You know, it's not something that you just say, oh, I'm gonna learn. You have to spend time on it. And I think the art of technical virtuosity, being good at what you do is a discipline. So whether you're like Roger Federer, who's a great you know, tennis player or Beethoven or Picasso or Michael Phelps or Rembrandt, they all worked at this discipline. And I think working at that is really, really important. Uh, and I think the 10,000 hour rule that Malcolm Gladwell says, to become world-class at anything, you have to put in 10,000 hours of practice. And you know, whether you're the Beatles, the Beatles spent <clears throat> some time in Germany where they really practiced and they became very good or you're Michael Jordan, or you're Van Gogh, or you're an ice hockey player. I think that's very, very important. So I wanna to stress to the residents that you must really spend that. And you can see this is a Pele's banana kick that he couldn't have mastered unless he'd really put a lot of time into it. Another case like that, this is a large uh, CP angle mass. But I think a case like this, you know, how do we approach it? Here's somebody who walked into my office, I think six months ago, hemiparetic, you know, having difficulty walking, difficulty swallowing. And you can see it's a fairly large uh, petroclival meningioma. Uh, and uh, I think I have the video on this and so I tend to go retromastoid. You have to work between the cranial nerves. So here we're peeling off the vessel uh, unfortunately, this is not a soft tumor. Parts of it were soft. Here we're peeling it off. Again, staying in that arachnoid plane. So this is really the art of microneurosurgery. Here we're separating it from the cerebellum. decompression from internally. And here you can see we've got mobilized the inferior pole and now we're coming superiorly a little bit more. So here you can see coming off completely there. And we had a really good resection there. And here's at the end, cerebellum, post-op MRI, completely clean. So I think microsurgery, and I think I want to talk a little bit about petroclival meningiomas. Uh, 
here, you know, this is to me the hardest thing we do in neurosurgery, especially when there's brainstem swelling. So here you can see we're looking at all the approaches we've used. Um, here's somebody with a petrochlival meningioma. If it's soft, like this one, here again, microsurgical technique, this is the tentorium, petrous bone. Here we're in the, uh, in the arachnoid plane, taking it off the brainstem. Trigeminal nerve, and we gamma knife the residual. You can see there's some residual in this, uh, in the cavernous sinus there. So I think in terms of metacognition, I will tell the younger people in the audience that it's important to publish your experiences. And it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of time, but I've always believed in doing that because I think you become better at what you do. So we published a series on petrochlorine meningioma and I was in Kuwait and one of the neurosurgeons came up to me and said, you know, thank you for your paper. And I said, why? And he said, you know, I had a malpractice case about a petroclival meningioma where I could only take out 40%. And they sued me saying, you know, you should have taken everything off. So he said, he quoted my paper because I put in my paper that though my outcomes were good in 92% of the patients, the gross total resection, and I had a neuroradiologist look at it, even if there was like five millimeters of tumor left, it was not a gross total resection. We said our gross total resection rate was only 28%. So you have to be very honest. And this is part of the metacognition that goes in with neurosurgery. So what is metacognition? It's thinking about thinking. So you look at your results and you say, well, what can I learn from this? All right. So the process is used to plan, monitor, and assess one's understanding and performance. And you have to look at yourself critically. And you know, even at my level or senior level, like Emma, we all do critical self-awareness. So I got a, a tumor yesterday, two days ago, inside the medulla, intramedullary, really large brain stem. It turned out to be a cystic astrocytoma. I was about 70% through, and I think maybe I should get out. The monitoring was good. But that's where metacognition comes in, that you want to have this sense of self-awareness. And this metacognition has now really been used in medicine a lot. So we look at it for reasoning skills. We look at it for complications. We look at it for how do you publish your papers, how aware you are. And I think that's an important thing. I think if I leave you with one thing today, it's that we need metacognition to become better neurosurgeons, better human beings. Because you're like, wait a minute, what did I learn from this? Okay. And how can we get better? And, and this is the same thing that Malcolm Gladwell talked about, the 10,000 10, hours. So here it is, an expert from a novice, you strive, you have failure, you solve problems. When you become an expert, you stop planning, you monitor, you keep evaluating. And I think that's very important that you keep looking at your results and saying, gee, what could I have tweaked? Go back and look at the videotape. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. If you don't have that awareness, if you don't have that metacognition, <clears throat> you're not going to get better. So I think that's important. And I think metacognition becomes so important when it comes to something like complications. We all want to say, oh, all my cases did great. Everybody went home post-op day three. There were no infections, no deficits. But the truth of the matter is complications occur in neurosurgery. And how we deal with them is part of metacognition. So this is Gilgamesh who said that if, if a physician treats a patient with a metal knife uh, or causes a severe wound, cause a man to die, his hand shall be cut off. Fortunately, we don't live in the era of Gilgamesh because if we did, a vast majority of neurosurgeons would have no hands because we've all had mortalities. And I think that's an important thing to learn. Also complications as they occur. So this is somebody with seven aneurysms. We didn't know which side bled. Uh, here it is, we're operating on this. And one of the things that I think metacognition comes in important is how do you handle something like intraoperative rupture? So this case still, when I look at it, it irks me. You can see there's an aneurysm in the, uh, here it's a, this is, there's two aneurysms. There's an ophthalmic, sort of pecom ophthalmic, and then there's a choroidal aneurysm here as well. So I look at this case as a metacognition for complication like, what did I do wrong, all right? So here you can see it's too tense, the aneurysm dome, all right? 
I'm not going to get this, all right? And you can see the neck. It's not really across the neck completely. Uh, I put the clip in. But in a case like this, I should have probably opened the neck. I should have dissected it free. I should have put a temporary clip on. I didn't do all that. And you'll see what happens. So here, these are fatal errors. Here it is. I'm pressing on the dome on that way. Shouldn't be doing that, OK? So I come a little bit on the other side. I try to readjust the clip again. Again, the torque is too much. The mistake here, this is what metacognition comes in, is that you be should have put a temporary clip on the carotid, either in the neck, but here it is, we're coming down in fairly, very, very tense, hard to get a clip across. You can see the aneurysm is not completely gone. And so you get a rupture and this is where your you know, thinking process, how are you gonna handle this? We were able to fix this. We were able to get a clip on and actually we got all seven aneurysms done and she actually did very well. She was about 10 years out. But if we don't look back at this and say, what is the metacognitive process? We don't think about what were you thinking? What could you have done better? You'll, I don't think we improve. So I think this was uh, you know, Shakespeare's great line where he said, this above, this above all, to thine own self be true. And it must fall as a night day that thou cannot be false to any man. And I don't think we can be dishonest about our complications. And this is part of metacognition. If things go wrong, we have to improve. And you can't blame other people for it. Uh, this is an AVM that came from another hospital and told them he's brain dead. And Roberto Heroes taught me this. You know, he said in his presidential address, you cannot pass a judgment on somebody else's work. You can't say, oh, they didn't know what they were doing. So that's part of awareness. And we go through hard times. This is a spinal cord tumor that I removed. And postoperatively, this patient, we did a beautiful case. Postoperatively, this patient was paraplegic. For three days, she was paraplegic. I went through hell, okay? Like, oh my God, what have I done? Three days later, she's moving her toes and she gets everything back. But in those three days, I feel like I aged 100 years. This is just her post-op. She actually had kids after that. She went on to do well. So this is an old Japanese thing about kintsugi bowls. That when you break these ceramic bowls, they're 400 years old, people would glue these bowls together with gold. And then they became more precious than the bowls that weren't broken. And the reason I bring this up is that complications, you know, we're much closer to the patient's families when we have complications. We spend much more time. And I think you become a better surgeon with this Kintsuki bowl. If you have more complications, you improve. You look at yourself, what can I do differently? What would I have done better? And I think I want to stress a little bit about medical is write papers. I just think for the younger generation, you should publish. This is our far lateral. Uh, this is our olfactory groove series where we went from one side and we showed that if you go unilaterally, the frontal lobe damage is not that bad. Then we looked at tuberculum cell meningiomas, visual function. So I think you, you should write. I think that's part of the metacognitive process that you think about how can I make things better or what can I think about? And I think history is a great source. I mean, I think uh, you, know, you want to look at great surgeons and say, what can we learn? This is Winslow who came up with the idea of the cavernous sinus and he thought it was a urological organ, but we published our paper showing how mistaken he was on that. We looked at the Simpson grading. You know, we looked at all our meningiomas. I think we had 700 meningiomas. And we published how the Simpson grading was still relevant. And I think this is the great power of research. So I published this paper. And then I get this letter from Dr. Simpson saying, congratulations. I wrote this paper in 1962. This is one of my most prized possessions. He died last year. But here he was at 91 years old, still remembered his paper from 50 years ago and said, thank you for doing the same work. And I think this is what keeps us alive in academics, helps us with metacognition. Again, anatomy is very important. I tell the younger generation, you wanna be more involved with anatomy. Uh, and of course, publishing these results. 
uh, cavernous sinus paper. And this is the number causes of deaths in Shakespeare's play. So my feeling is you take a topic, you put your soul into it, and metacognitively, you will come into something good. This is the causes of death in all of Shakespeare's plays, okay? Stabbing, poisoning, beheading. I think this is a fascinating paper. So I think these sort of instances of us improving become really, really important. Uh, I'll skip this in the interest of time. I think I have 45 minutes, right? This is just, again, coming to the art of what we do. This is a cavernous uh, sinus tumor. It was actually a, a schwannoma inside the cavernous sinus, which has beautiful planes that we actually removed. This patient only had a sixth nerve palsy. And it's interesting, I removed this tumor, and postoperatively, the sixth nerve was gone. But here, there's a nice plane. This is not a meningioma. Again, microneurosurgery. And you can see he did well. Postoperatively, he's clean. He's fine. So I think if you take a topic, and I just happen to like skull base, it could be functional neurosurgery, it could be Parkinson's, it could be spine. I think you work on it, you publish on it, and you know we kind of wrote papers on this and stuff. But I also think in terms of metacognition, bad things can still happen. Look at this. This is a petroclival meningioma, beautifully removed. Patient did great. Then he got C. diff when he was in rehab. Three weeks later, he went into sepsis and he died. So bad things can happen, you need to be aware, and it's not just with surgery, okay? This is gamma knife, and you can see this was this is the acoustic neuroma, and they put a hole in the peduncle. Uh, and then this was the case in Chicago where they had some mistake in the uh, in the in the in the radio surgery where it caused 10 people, six patients to get 10 times the dose for trigeminal neuralgia. All these six patients, their brainstem was cooked and they were dead in six months. And I've addressed this in my book. I think these are important things that we need to think about. And if you're feeling bad about yourself and your patient died, this is Joseph Liston. He operated on somebody, did an amputation in like 39 seconds. And the patient died, his assistant whom he cut, he died and an observer passed out. So it was like a 300% mortality. Sometimes it's best not to do anything. So here it is a petroclival meningioma just with hydrocephalus that we shunted and everything went well. So I think this metacognition is sort of knowledge plus experience and that's how you get to wisdom. You think about what is the right decision, how you approach this, it becomes very important. And the main thing is you should not harm anybody. I think uh, primum non nocere is a very important concept that we all need to be aware of, yeah. And again, like I said, you write papers, you get that done. So now I'm going to switch turns a little bit from uh, about metacognition to residents and things and training and healthcare costs, because that's part of the metacognition that you got to think about things. You got to think about costs. Like, look at the healthcare costs in the United States. We spend so much money on healthcare. Our outcomes aren't great. In the United States, spine has become a big business now. And people are like, wait a minute, none of these studies show anything. So that awareness is important. And then we know, even with the COVID crisis, that economic disparities make a big difference. Here's the Titanic. Uh, number of people died. If you went first class, your mortality was 39%. You went third class, it was 75%. So we know safety and stuff becomes part of this improvement. In the Institute of Medicine, they said about 100,000 lives are lost. And so in the Wall Street Journal, which is on the front page, they said that every year there's Dr. Hodad in each hospital. It stands for Hands of Death and Destruction. Uh, and you can look at things like this. This was, uh, you know, errors that happen. Somebody goes an MRI with the tank, and the tank goes right through the head. And this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. An orthopedic surgeon operated on the wrong side. So this is a huge error, but I think awareness of this is extremely important and we work on that. And this is a slide I use with my residents all the time, that the Swiss cheese model, if something goes through like this, if the mistakes happen, it's because these piles of cheese are not aligned properly. And we can learn from the aviation industry about how things have improved with the accident rate, why we need to be much more aware uh, and I think on a global level, neurosurgeons need to be aware of things like obesity, 
have exploded. And, you know, in the United States, we have a large obesity population, and there's a problem with spine for that. Uh, this is Michelangelo's day. And then I think drug overdose. We, when I was a resident, we gave narcotics liberally. And all this oxycodone that we gave has caused so many deaths. So the thing is, all that research was based on one letter to the New England Journal of Medicine. There was no data. They said, oh, oxycodone is not addictive. It's less than 1%. And we now know with over 50,000 people dying that that was a huge issue. So I think in medicine, you want to have disruptive innovations, you know, like Ambrose Pare, Joseph Lister, uh, Florence Nightingale, our own Harvey Cushing, Murray Curie, and Bryce Mar Barry Marshall. Uh, and I'll skip this. This is just an older lady. So, um, so I think this is big data, things that we look at that all of you should be cognitively aware. We looked at big trends in big data from the National Inpatient Database. So these are good tools for research to improve. But I think it all comes down to one thing. There has to be a level of integrity about what you're doing. And that's part of metacognition. This is Czesław Milusz, the great uh, Polish poet who said in a room where people unanimously maintain a conspiracy in silence, one word of truth should be like a pistol shot. I want our residents to be pistol shots. And we've made mistakes. Historically, you look at neurosurgery, we did lobotomies on people, which never worked. And so I think uh, I personally feel that our obligation is to help out. Uh, and I think this is where Yoko Kato's work comes in. She's done enormous work for the WFNS. And, you know, we in the United States, we're blessed. We have 100,000 people to one neurosurgeon. Well, in sub-Saharan Africa, it was 8 million people to one neurosurgeon. And you look here, it's almost now come down significantly. And this is from the work of the WFNS that all these young neurosurgeons were trained. So I think I'll end with mentorship. The word mentor comes from Telemachus, who was Odysseus's son. And he entrusted his son when he went to war in the, in the great Trojan War. He entrusted his son to Minerva, who was really mentor, but she came as a male and became his sort of guardian angel. And that's where the word mentorship comes from. And I think we're all grateful to mentors to get better. Uh, I personally am very indebted to Perry Black, John McDonald, Peter Janetta. Peter Janetta was the best and I think Emma agrees with me, he knew him, came across him and felt that he was a great guy. So I think, you know, people like Mike Apozzo, Kim Virchow, David Klein, Roberto Heros, Mitch Berger, these are all great individuals. And I think mentors are very, very important. If you are successful, then you will be a mentor for somebody else. If you're young, you look up to other people for mentorship. And I think that's an important a part of what we do. Uh, and I think there should be diversity. This is one of the great paintings, the chess game by a female uh, painter. And it shows, and I think female leadership in neurosurgery is important, uh, that we have more female neurosurgeons and we do better in mentorship. And as much as people say times are not good, I think in the end, we are here to sort of help people. And this is after we had the Sandy Hook uh, massacre uh, James Keenan, a Boston th a theologian, said, mercy is entering into the chaos of another. We do that every day. It's a privilege, whether you're doing microsurgery, whether you're doing mentorship, whether you're doing metacognition. Compassion is what binds us. It's the most important thing. You can look at this in art. This is Luke Fildix's painting about the doctor. Luke Fildix's own daughter had died at nine years old, and he was so grateful to the doctor who spent the night with her that he made this painting. Uh, this is a girl that I operate on, a Hispanic uh, kid who couldn't speak English and her mother couldn't speak English. This is, a, this is a AVM at C1, C2 junction. She was quadriplegic, got quadriplegic. I took it out, but the night before I operated on her, her mother said to me, this is the most precious thing in the world to me. That's why we're all in medicine. And I think that's something that sort of reminds us of that. And in the end, I think we have to remember what Cushing said so beautifully. There is only one thing that can effectively bind people, and that is a common devotion. All of you listening today, you know, we are devoted to a compassionate calling, a realistic calling to do good.
to be aware of what we do, to improve of what we do. And, uh, you know, I like this Japanese Zen uh, thing last year, a foolish monk, this year, no change. So I think epidemics are a part of life. Uh, this is the rainbow. At the height of the epidemic, this rainbow appeared uh, on New York City when, you know, thousands of people were dying. And I love this poem by Mary Oliver. It's a serious thing just to be alive on this fresh morning in this broken world. So I think we're very fortunate. I want to urge all of you to be safe, to wear masks, to practice social distancing. Uh, it's been a real honor and privilege to be with you, with all of you here today. And I'm open for questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Nanda. It's wonderful as usual. There are many things, you know, many lessons you can learn from this talk. I uh, I open the floor for this questions, maybe two or three questions. Take yeah. it with the mint professor Atul Goel. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> Hello, yeah Dr. Atul. Anil, that was a that was a wonderful presentation of showing good cases, having you know the legs firmly grounded and shoulder high, doing good work, but with you know, politeness and with having humility, showing great work, multiple articles I, can see, I could see, multiple philosophical notes, multiple things that we, as uh, Dr. Ahmed said, multiple things can be learned. You see, uh, many people may not know that uh, Anil is not only an achiever, but he remains very much grounded to you know, to philosophy and to mythology and to culture, despite the fact that he's completely American. He comes to visit, you know, Satya Sai in Bangalore, near Bangalore on a regular basis and uh, prays there and uh, has a, you know, heart of absolute go. So my best wishes to you, Anil, and I really enjoyed and I hope you continue giving these kind of lessons to at least to young people who should be motivated to do good work, to write articles, and despite that, remain firmly grounded. That is the basis of your lecture, I have a feeling, Anil. Thank you very much. I just want to ask some short question because this is very important. Uh, Anil, that is, you talked about cognition, and this is, I believe, it's very important process in learning. How can we teach our resident that is a process of cognition to be self-aware about their ability, what they can, what they cannot? Because this is a crucial point or in the training process when the young man feels he can do everything. What's the reality? How can we teach it? I think it's important. I learned it from Professor Janelle. Okay, we yes. were at m and &M, There was a big complication. Spine. Somebody went paraplegic, and we had just went to spine fusion. Then Professor Janetta told the attending, "He's like, you know, if we're going to go into this, we have to be very honest. We have to look at ourselves, say, what are we doing right? What are we?" And I thought he was an amazing mentor because he was very honest. You know, he didn't sugarcoat anything, and I think. You know, Emma, you can teach metacognition by being an example, which I'm sure you are. And I think that humility and that fact that, you know, we don't want to say, you know, we did 3,000 craniotomies and everybody went home on post-op day one. Because you know that's not true. But, I mean, we all get complications. So I think, personally, m and is the single most important thing. Uh, that you have to run that with the moral DNA of a department is how you run m and because it just should be completely honest. You know, there shouldn't be any, you know, oh, we did this, I'm the thing, this and that, so. Uh. Okay, thank you very much. You know, you know, we can talk about this for ages. And um, Bita Janetta was a great man. You know, still oh. I remember everything about him. Great. Time I spent with him. Now I think it's the time to move to the second talk. And it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce Professor Hu Ji, from, uh, food and, from Food and University, Hushan Hospital. He is going to talk about uh, resective surgery for refractory epilepsy of motor cortical region. Please, Dr. Hoji. Uh, Thank you, Professor Amar. Thank you for your introduction. 
introduction. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my, it's a great honor for me to be inv invited to speak, uh, to be a speaker in the ECN's webinar. Tonight, my topic is uh, resective surgery for refractory epilepsy of motor cortical resection. As we know, the, the resective surgery in motor cortical region is uh, is hard and uh, very dangerous because of the high frequency of postoperative neurological deficit after uh, resective surgery in the motor cortical region. Uh, now let's begin. Let's begin with uh, one case. Uh, one case illust illustration. This is a 14-year-old male patient, right-handed. His chief complaint is intermittent seizure attack for 10 years, semiologist, tonic abduction of bilateral upper limb, right side a little earlier, and then, and then right version of gaze and the tonic clonic movement. When the seizure occurred not during sleep, there is aura, right lower limb weakness. Most seizure occurred during sleep. Although multiple anti-epileptic drugs was, was used the seizure cannot well control. No history of head trauma, anoxia, fibroid, convulsion, and encephalitis. Neuropsychological examination is normal. This is interrectal scalp EEG. Show the left frontal central region, um, high frequency epileptic discharge. The F3, C3, C3, P3, the left frontal central region, uh, display the high frequency of Epileptic, epileptic discharge. Uh, this is a one, one seizure attack. Uh, EG onset is from the left front to central region, uh, F3, C3, C3, P3. This is a EG epileptic discharge uh, spread to this is another seizure attack. The EG onset is also from the left to front to central region, uh, F3, C3. Uh, let's watch a short video when the semiology of the patient, when seizure occur, when a patient is awake. We can observe the, um, the tonic abduction of bilateral upper limbs. And then there is a um, right version of a uh, case. And uh, the semiology when the patient is, is sleeping. Also, we can observe the tonic abduction of bilateral upper limb. Uh, so the, the most obvious semiology of the patient is tonic uh, posture, the proximal side, a proximal tonic posture. The right side is a little earlier. So based on the EEG and the semiology, uh, the EEG show frequent epileptic discharge in the left front central region and the EEG onset is also from the left central uh, frontal region. And the semiology, uh, the typical semiology is a tonic posture of bilateral up limb, especially uh, right side is a little earlier. So we consider the epileptogenic zone may, may be located in the uh, left frontal central region. Now let's look at uh, MRI. Uh, this is an um, almost negative MRI negative case. It 
it it seems uh, it's not uh, not easy to find uh, uh, the lesion the the abnormal lesion the ab abnormal region is uh, is almost negative. Uh, look, let's look at uh, FDGPT. From the FDGPT, we can find a small, a slightly hypometabolism meta region, a small uh, region with, which is slightly hypometabolism. Uh, this region, uh, this region, uh, left frontal central region. And uh, in the colonal Colonel image of PT uh, in this region is uh, hypometabolism region. When our FDGPT can, is fused with MRI, uh, this region, uh, this region is uh, a small region, hypometabolism. The corresponding area in T1 MRI for the hypometabolism region looks normal, uh, looks normal in the T1 MRI. So the summary for phase one evaluation, the semiology suggests uh, the epileptogenic, the epileptogenic zone may be located in left frontal, left side, left frontal region. And it's the scalp EEG left frontal central region, they frequent spike and slow complex waves. FDGPT, left frontal premotor area, hypometabolism. Uh, MRI, almost negative. But when we uh, look at the MRI carefully and uh, again and again, look carefully, we can find uh, a very uh, not very not obvious abnormal region. Uh, this region is a suspected abnormal region. In the, this is central central socks, uh, central gyrus. This is pre-central socks. Uh, this is um, superior frontal socks. Uh, this is this is central socks. Uh, this pre-central socks. This is pre-central gyrus. So. Uh, this is a suspected abnormal region. So uh, when we uh, reconstructed uh, from the MRI, uh, the suspected abnormal region uh, located in this area. Uh, this is central socks, this pre-central gyrus, uh, this pre-central socks. So the suspected abnormal region centered at at the junction, at the junction of precentral socks and uh, superior frontal socks, and uh, precentral socks, precentral pre gyrus is involved, especially the anterior part of precentral gyrus uh, is involved. So we place the SEG electrodes to confirm whether this suspected region responsible for seizure and uh, try to define the boundary of the, of the abnormal region. Uh, this is um, SEG electrode plan, the position, the relationship between the electrode's position and the suspected lesion. Uh, there are eight electrodes placed uh, past uh, passed through or surrounded uh, the suspected lesion. SEG show 
frequent epileptic discharge in electrode A and B. Uh, frequent epileptic discharge in, in electrode A and B. This is um, one seizure attack. The SEG onset from electrode A and B and uh, free, uh, very quickly spread to electrode C, uh, this electrode C and uh, electrode E, especially the small number context of electrode C and uh, electrode E. This is a uh, uh, high frequency SEG uh, over the frequency is over 53 hertz. Uh, also show the SEG electrode from originating from electrode A and B and uh, E and C uh, is very quickly involved. So the SEG results, uh, the seizure attack uh, originating from electrode A1, A1, A and B, the contact one to A and the contact one to A, one to A of electrode A and B. Uh, this is the uh, actual position of uh, contact three of electrode A. Uh, A3 means the third contact of electrode A. Uh, this contact uh, located in this uh, this position, the red the red mark is is made by me to show the central socks. Uh, this red mark show the is used to show the central socks. Uh, this is central socks. So the A3, the contact of electrode A located in the precentral gelus, is uh, in the anterior part of precentral gelus. And also the A4 located in the precentral gelus, uh, the anterior bank of, pre of precentral gelus. And A5 also located in the precentral gelus, anterior bank. And the B5, uh, this is central gelus. So this is central, central socks. Uh, this is so uh, B5 also very close to precentral gelus. And uh, B6. Uh, this is the context electrode, the sixth context of electrode B, also located in precentral gelus, the anterior bank of precentral gelus. This is this red mark for precentral socks, the central socks, uh, this central socks. The red mark is for uh, to show the central socks. Uh, we also do the DCS, uh, direct, direct, direct electrical, direct cortical stimulation, direct, direct electrical cortical stimulation. So we observed, observed after discharge in the electric A, B, C, E with very low electrical current stimulation. So this also suggests A, B, C, E may may be responsible for uh, the seizure attack of the patient. So this is SEG confirmed epileptic lesion. Uh, this lesion uh, uh, involved precentral gelus. This is central socks. So what is the treatment for this patient? Uh, because the lesion, uh, part of the lesion, part of the uh, the suspect the ESEG confirmed lesion located in the precentral gelus, especially the anterior part of precentral gelus, is involved by lesion. So, what's the best treatment for this patient? Uh, radio frequency ablation is uh, is fashionable now, uh, but uh, this method uh, cannot uh, cannot uh, completely uh, destroy the lesion. Can cannot completely abraded the lesion. So the seizure free uh, the, uh, is, is rare after radio frequency ablation. For VNS, DBS, and RNS also is uh, also cannot uh, only in very small percentage in very small percentage of number number uh, percentage of patient can can get seizure free. And the corpse care uh, uh, most patient after corpse calcitomy 
uh, only can improve seizure symptoms, cannot get seizure free. So uh, only the surgical resection for this patient, uh, most, uh, uh, most patient uh, can get seizure free if we can completely remove the lesion. So after discussed discuss with the patient, with the patient uh, relatives, we finally uh, choose the surgical resection for this patient. Uh, this is a surgical plan for this patient. We try to imp to resect uh, this uh, this this area. Uh, this is central trail central socks. Uh, this central socks. So this is a uh, uh, precentral gyrus. Uh, part of precentral gyrus will will be removed, including the anterior anterior bank anterior part of precentral gyrus. Uh, this is central socks. Uh, so uh, the precentral gyrus, uh, part of precentral gyrus, gyrus is planned to be resected. Uh, this is a um, uh, surgical plan uh, showing the 3D brain. Uh, we will try to remove uh, this area, including the anterior part of precentral gyrus. When we open the dura, Firstly, we uh, use SEP uh, to identify the central shocks. Uh, this is central shocks confirmed by SSEP. So this is precentral gyrus. Uh, this is precentral uh, shocks. Uh, the lesion, uh, the lesion located in this area, uh, involved anterior bank, anterior part of precentral gyrus, and. Uh, the lesion, part of the lesion is below the, the large draining vein. Uh, this, uh, this picture shows the uh, intra, this is uh, intraoperative picture after removal, after removal of the lesion. So uh, part of the placental gyrus, uh, anterior part, anterior part of placental gyrus was removed. But and the, both the, the small vein and the large vein was uh, preserved well. This is MRI, a follow up MRI, show the anterior bank, anterior part, precentral pre gyrus was removed. Uh, uh, follow up uh, until now, 25 months, uh, seizure free. Pathology diagnosis is FCD type 2A. So how to safely resect epileptic lesion involving mode cortex? In the literature, this is a literature review. Uh, this, this review including 16 papers, uh, uh, 16 papers, uh, totally 280 cases, which, uh, which is uh, uh, resective surgery in the mode cortex uh, about 67% patient uh, has uh, good, uh, good control of seizure, uh, but a very high, fre high frequency, very high rate uh, of patient uh, show uh, suffered motor deficit, uh, short-term motor deficit, but long-term motor deficit rate uh, also is high, about uh, one quarter of patient uh, has long-term motor deficit. Uh, this result is from the literature. Uh, Short-term motor deficit rate about 60%. Long-term motor deficit is about uh, 25. So if you want to uh, improve the safety of uh, resective surgery in motor cortex, we have to know cytoarchitecture architecture of motor cortex. In the different region of cortex, there is a, a different set of architecture. Uh, only in the primary motor cortex, uh, primary motor cortex, uh, yeah, name uh, Brodmann, Brodmann A, Brodmann area, four, four area. Uh, only in primary motor cortex contains uh, giant bed cells. Uh, giant bed cells is the uh, major, is the key neuron for motor function. Uh, BA4, this Brodema A, Brodema 4 area is uh, primary motor cortex, primary motor cortex. 
uh, this area contains joint bed cells. We, I, as we know, joint bed cells is the um, most important neuron for motor function. But uh, this is uh, central shocks, uh, this is precentral shocks. So only the posterior bank of precentral gelus contains joint bed cells. For the anterior bank, anterior part of precentral gelus uh, contains uh, almost no joint bed cells. This uh, this <clears throat> this result uh, uh, in the is published in the neurosurgery. Uh, this author summarized the result of motor deficit rate uh, when the resective surgery involved the motor cortex uh, div divided into four areas. Only this area, uh, this area, the posterior superior region of mode of central shocks of pre-central shocks, almost 100 of patients uh, display the short-term motor deficit. The lowest percentage of short-term motor deficit uh, was observed in this area. For the long-term motor deficit, is also uh, the highest rate, the highest rate of motor, motor deficit observed in the this area in, in the posterior superior region of precentral shocks, precentral gelus, uh, precentral gelus. Uh, for this area is, is, is safe. Uh, Long-term motor deficit is almost 0%. So the key techniques to protect motor function, we have to keep in mind the key role of posterior bank of precentral gelus. Uh, which is indispensable for motor function. We have to protect fiber pathways. Uh, that means the white mat arising from the motor cortex. Uh, this is very important. And we uh, have to protect vessels, arteries, and veins, the draining veins for the motor cortex. And uh, uh, SEP can can help to identify central shocks. Intraoperative neural navigation can help identify the boundary. And uh, this is, can help to mapping motor cortex. NEP can be used to continuously monitor motor response during uh, operation. Awake surgery uh, can be used to evaluate motor function uh, when, uh, when we do operation to resective surgery in the motor cortex. And this is a short video to, to show uh, that the patient uh, operation. This is a uh, DCS mapping. Uh, this is a mapping with the DCS to match the motor function area. This is continuous NEP monitoring during operation, NEP, continuous NEP monitoring. This is a weak anesthesia during operation, continuously monitor the motor function of the hand. Now it's, uh, it's re remove the anterior part of the precentral gyrus. Uh, we just remove the gray, Gray matter of precentral gelus, uh, but uh, preserve the white matter. We preserve the white matter, only remove the gray matter of precentral gelus. This is artery passed through the lesion. Uh, this artery is preserved and the, both the small draining vein and the large draining vein preserved. Anterior part, anterior bank of the precentral gelus was removed. This is the motor function on the eighth day after operation of the patient. 
uh, a little weak of the right side. Uh, a little weak in the, of the right side. The patient can walk, but uh, are not very stable. Uh, a little weak on the, on the right side. But one month after operation, the motor function of the patient uh, recovered uh, almost normal. The, the patient can walk very quickly and stably. Uh, this is another case. Uh, this patient also is a uh, 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 seizure. The uh, uh, seizure onset, the uh, seizure lesion is located in motor cortex. This is semiology. The patient semiology is. Uh, It's the left, left hand, left forearm, chronic. Left, the chronic of left hand. And this is the lesion. Uh, the lesion of the patient are uh, located in the central socks, uh, in the central socks. This is central socks. This is pre-central gyrus. Uh, it located, locate, the lesion located in the bottom of the central socks. This is a 3D image show the location of epileptic lesion. Uh, this is central shocks. Uh, this is a lesion. The lesion located in the bottom of central shocks. This is a post. This is a post central gyrus. This is pre central gyrus. Uh, this central shocks. So this is a picture of the uh, removal of the lesion. Uh, this is uh, central shocks. This post uh, post central post-central post shock, jealous, pre-central jealous. The lesion completely removed and the follow-up 25 months uh, seizure-free. This is uh, multifunction of the patient three months after resective surgery. This is the left hand. Uh, this is the right hand. Uh, uh, three months later, uh, after operation, uh, the motor function uh, recovered almost normal. Uh, another case, uh, the lesion uh, located in the uh, uh, pre-central socks. Uh, this is the this is central socks. Uh, this, this is the pre-central gyrus. Central shocks, pre-central gyrus, uh, pre-central shocks. Pre-central gyrus is involved by lesion. Uh, this is an intraoperative picture. We remove the lesion, uh, including the anterior part of pre-central gyrus. And also uh, three months later after operation, uh, the patient uh, function the motor function of of a hand is uh, uh, right hand this left hand and uh, follow up four years seizure free so uh, the summary a comprehensive pre-surgical evaluation is important in localization at leptogenic zone. The resection of anterior bank of pre-central gyrus is relatively safe, but posterior bank of pre-central gyrus is indispensable for motor function and must be protected. Multiple IRMM techniques and awake anesthesia are crucial to safe surgery and function, function protection. I, I appreciate uh, uh, the work, the contribution of our team, our 
other key members, uh, Doctor uh, Sister Jiang, Doctor Lui Ben, uh, and etc. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hu Ji. This is wonderful, uh, great educational lecture, and congratulations for your uh, very skillful uh, technique and um, precise. Uh, uh, location and work up before the, for every patient. Now the floor is open for uh, questions. Yeah, if the new would like to ask something, Professor. Hello, Prof. Uh, thank you for a very nice uh, presentation. I have two questions here, Prof. Uh, in cases that uh, involve the posterior portion of motor cortex, so what were your options? Uh, uh, definitely you have mentioned that it's, it's it, uh, most likely a patient we have deficit if you operate on that part. Second question is, uh, Prof, uh, did you study uh, the cess specimen that been removed from the brain? Uh, any, any form of study in terms of histopathology uh, to look at the uh, pathological differences from the normal brain? Thank you, Prof. I thank you. Uh, uh, usually, for the lesion, epileptic lesion uh, located in the motor cortex uh, in, in our center, uh, we usually prefer the surgical resection uh, because I, I did uh, many cases uh, in uh, such, such kind of case, lots of cases. Uh, uh, almost only one case I remember. Uh, in the early staging, when I do this operation, uh, which uh, there's no no monitoring, uh, less monitoring and uh, less uh, experience, uh, and now I I know uh, which area, uh, especially the posterior bank of central gyrus, uh, which is we have to be uh, uh, usually especially have to be protected. And uh, now I usually I when I do this kind of operation, there is uh, uh, multiple monitoring, in, including the uh, uh, neurophysiological monitoring and uh, anesthesia awake 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 anesthesia, uh, and, and uh, usually we 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 achieve good results. Uh, so. Because the other methods I, I, I mentioned in the presentation, they, they cannot, uh, usually cannot get seizure free after operation. Uh, right. But for uh, this lesion, especially for the uh, uh, epilepsy case, uh, the lesion usually not tumor. Uh, and, uh, usually the, the pathology is uh, FCG. Uh, FCG uh, to reset is, FCG is much, uh, much harder than tumor. Uh, because the FCG usually uh, there is no clear border. Uh, almost uh, the, the color and the texture is close to normal tissue. So uh, we have to, uh, before the operation, we have to do a very careful surgical plan. Uh, you have to know the, the lesion uh, close to uh, which socks, uh, close to which vessel. And uh, we have to use the uh, neural navigation. Uh, we have to use uh, 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 an EP monitoring, uh, use anesthesia, where we can anesthesia, and uh, use DCS uh, mapping uh, during operation. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, it's a wonderful lecture. And uh, about, I would like to ask your opinion about uh, awake anesthesia in such cases. Because um, if you are, because this has happened with everybody who really has experience with uh, awake anesthesia in lesions uh, near motor area, as I have, that sometimes you know exactly you are in the precise area, in the direct location, you are working on it. And then you found the patient started to have weakness and you are still in the middle of it. You didn't remove the region completely. What would be your decision to continue or to stop? Because this is a question came in the mind of everyone, especially in developing their career. Do you, 
do you see what I mean? You are in the surgery, you no. know exactly where you are. You mm -hmm. are right in the position, the monitor is okay. And then yeah. you still 50% removed of the region, the other 50% still, and the patient started to complain of weakness. What would be your decision at that time? To stop the surgery or to continue? Uh, uh, when we do the operation to resective relation, uh, involve the motor cortex, uh, continue to uh, monitor the motor function. Uh, uh, when the motor function is uh, uh, is, uh, is is in uh, when I'm not my motor function become abnormal, so I will I will check uh, uh, if if I the, the site when I I dissect the the, the site uh, the way the location I have to check carefully if we if I damage the normal normal brain tissue. Usually I will continue, but I I will uh, I will make sure uh, make sure again. The, the tissue I dissected is normal or abnormal. It's very important. Usually, uh, uh, if we can only dissect the, the lesion, the abnormal tissue, the, the muscle strength uh, will be not affected. If the, if the muscle strength and the, the motor function is affected, maybe I have damaged the normal brain tissue. I have to have to change. I have to care. I have to be very careful. We 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 usually continue operation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It, this is a, a wonderful webinar. We we had a chance to listen to two great neurosurgeons, uh, Doctor Anil Nanda, who really taught us a lot and as well Dr. Um, uh, Huji, who we learned from his technique and uh, uh, very skillful techniques. And thank you very much for everyone and hope we will uh, meet you again in another webinar. Yeah. So, yes, thank, you. Uh, thank you so much for the privilege of uh, coming for this webinar and I want to wish all of you safety, social distancing, and I hope the world is a safer place that we can meet in person again soon. Thank you again. Definitely. So I think Thank you. now it's time we'll wind up. We are sorry we cannot take more questions as we are already run out of time. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Suyoku Kaito, I would like to sincerely thank today's speaker, Professor Anil Nanda and uh, Professor QG, who have come here and taught us about uh, their respective specialities. Thank you, Professor Ammar, for coming here and chairing this session. Professor Atul Goel, thank you very much for coming here and listening to and supporting the ACNS webinars. So until uh, next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you, Liu, for joining, and thank you all the attendees.